everyone, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk. Movie Talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Mark Ellis. <laughs> and this is a daily show where we bring you all the latest in the world of movies, plus a little bit of insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is Collider senior producer, John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Ashley's not here today, apparently, but... <laughs> Wow, he's actually crushing it so far. I'm I so changed my hair and nobody noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for nothing. Also joining us today is one of the hosts of the Arrow After Show and Pittsburgh Steelers third string quarterback, Josh McCoo. <laughs> hey, hey, Mark, how are you, buddy? I, uh, I would like everybody to know out there that I have followed Mark Hairstyles uh, since 2011, <laughs> and they are fantastic. You've got I, like uh, a scrapbook. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, like yeah, all, all kinds. Through the years. Mark and I had Buffalo Wild Wings in 2011, 2012, <laughs> 2013. That's all it goes. Hey, I should mention this. If you get a chance, it's not it's not everywhere. I think the only place you can see this is on uh, Christian's uh Periscope, and I hate plugging Christian's Periscope, but um, Saturday night, well, Saturday was the celebration of uh, Christian Harloff's birthday, and we were all there, and I gotta tell you, Josh McCuga gave a roast speech that had us rolling, and then Mark <laughs> Ellis wrapped it all up, and it was just, it was an incredibly fun show, and I remember saying to my wife, I really thought this was going to be a disaster, <laughs> you know, because you get a circle of buddies where all the buddies think their buddies are yeah. funny, but really, they're just not funny. <laughs> it was a funny, funny show. It was a funny, funny night. I enjoyed myself It immensely. wasn't the roast at, like, the Omaha Insurance Convention, <laughs> you know. We, there were some professional comedians up there that really brought it. It was a ton of fun. Your, your speech was actually very uh, not professional. Funny. Very professional. <laughs> My speech was very not it funny. Was, it was the acceptance speech of his political tenure and of John Campy for president <laughs> 2020. <laughs> All right. Hey, listen, before we get going with, with the news, we sh I wanted to mention this, too. On yesterday's movie talk, somebody sent in a really cool question. I, I, I'm forgetting the name of the person who sent in. I'm sorry. By basically saying, hey, do you think it might be great? I mean, because a lot of people complain about kids in theaters, and a lot of parents never go to theaters because they don't know what to do with their kids. If a movie theater had daycare in their theater, so parents could come check their kid in, like your coat, you get a little ticket for them, check the kid in. <laughs> it's like at the crime the room at church. <laughs> yes, ex that's exactly what it is. <laughs> you check them in, you go into the movie, and we said it's a great idea, but I don't know how you could practical work, practically work it out. Well, thanks to all of you guys jumping in the comments section, we were made aware that Harkins Theaters, which I you have to forgive me for not being really familiar with them because there's not many, if any, right around here. But uh, Harkins Theaters, which are bigger in the mid-United States, I guess, um, they actually do have that uh, system. So I'd be really curious to know if any of you guys uh, live near Harkins and have taken advantage of Harkins Daycare, then... Um, Comment in this video and let me know if you thought it was a good or positive experience. Let me know how it works out for you. Because anyway, I just thought we should mention that since yesterday we said, I don't know how you practically work it out. Well, apparently somebody did practically work it out and I wanted to bring attention to it. So good job. Let's know how it's going. And Mark Ellis will be standing outside of one this weekend looking for single moms. <laughs> um, thank God I am not taking my kids there because my kids are fictional. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Okay, first up, recently Variety had reported that Universal had zeroed in on four potential directors for the upcoming Fast and Furious 8. Those names included Straight Outta Compton's F. Gary Gray, Now You See Me's Louis Leterrier, The Signal's Will Eubank, and Your Next and The Guest's Adam Wingard. On the heels of that report, franchise star Vin Diesel released this picture on his Facebook page with F. Gary Gray talking in front of a board covered with Fast and Furious images. John, do we have our Fast and Furious 8 director? Um, look, the, the studio, which is universal, and it should be noted here, don't forget, Vin Diesel has no say in who the director <laughs> is. <laughs> he actually doesn't. I think he wanted, um, who was it that he wanted, the, the director of the first Fast and Furious, was Rob Cohen? I can't, I can't remember, but the director of the first, he actually wanted the first director from Fast and Furious to come back and do this one. He said, because Paul Walker talked a lot about it, mm. and so clearly that didn't happen. But it's kind of hard to deny this is what is happening. I mean, when you got these two guys taking pictures with each other, posing for Facebook in front of a bunch of Fast and the Furious images, that is pretty much the de facto way of them announcing it. And I got to tell you, it is not... The first name that I would have gravitated to, like when people were asking me the last few weeks, who do you see directing Fast and Furious 8? I probably listed about 12 or 15 guys. F. Gary Gray was never on that list. But now that his name is in there, I gotta tell you, I don't mind the name at all. When you, and forget Straight Outta Compton for a minute. 
I think one of his more underappreciated films is actually Law Abiding Citizen that he did with Jamie Foxx and Gerard Butler. Now, the end of that movie completely falls apart, and it's, it's a terrible ending. But for the first 70%, 80% of that movie, I thought F. Gary Gray did such a great job of combining bits of action with tension and great characters and did a really magnificent job with it. When I think about that movie, now I think about that director coming to do a Fast and the Furious, yeah, I'm on board. Once again, not the first name I would have picked, but definitely a name I can personally get behind. Mark, what do you think? I think this is definitely happening because Vin Diesel has told us all along that, hey, I'm going to announce on my Facebook page who's directing this new movie. <laughs> he posted a picture on his Facebook page. I take Vin Diesel's Facebook page like the Bible. As okay? gospel. <laughs> That's absolutely how you... And I think Vin Diesel probably does have a say in who the director is or he at least is in touch with the producers of the film because he the, the, all these reports that he might have been a little difficult to work with on set, that if you're just producing this movie, you want to make sure you're starting your franchise guy is happy with who the director is. He might not have the final say, but I think it's a little bit like asking I'm Kobe sure or influence. LeBron, who yeah. do you want to coach you because yeah. we want you to be happy. So yeah. I believe this is happening, and I'm such a fan of Straight Outta Compton. It was such a cool way to tell that story with multiple characters. You had a lot of dimensions. There are a lot of leads in that. There's a lot of moving parts of the Fast and Furious 8 film as well, I'm sure. So having F. Gary Gray come in, I think, is the right move. Josh? I, well, I think... First of all, I love Straight Outta Compton too, and early '90s rap is some of my favorite things. And I thought he portrayed that whole thing perfectly. I think the the problem with a lot of when you bring in directors of a movie that isn't so much an action franchise is that Fast and the Furious Seven, you were jumping cars from building to building. Like you have to keep building on it or rein it back and and make a whole different movie as part of the franchise because it's gone this crazy crescendo. Now, if F. Gary Gray can bring it back into, like you said, like a law-abiding law -abiding right. citizen kind of way, maybe more of like a heady kind of action movie with cars, and then finally somebody will make a VIN number joke in <laughs> one of the movies. It's been seven, guys, and no VIN number jokes? It's right in your face. Yeah, not um, even a diesel fuel joke. Nothing. Like, give us something, man. And with all this turbo diesel v VW stuff that's gone down come on it's just open <laughs> season but I, I nothing f gary gray has done has disappointed me yet so i don't see why not give him the reins yeah and but by the way it was rob cohen who, who directed the first one it's interesting you mentioned you either got to take a next step forward because we're talking about you know fast and furious in space or whatever yeah, right. or or you got to rein it back which is what right. you said right and which is interesting because i remember hearing vin diesel talking a bit about how when he was talking about maybe trying to get Rob Cohen or wanting Rob Cohen back, taking Fast and Furious back to its roots and make it a movie about racing. Yeah. And that intrigues me. Look, I love the ridiculousness ever since they brought The Rock on board. Yeah. I, the, something happened in this franchise for me in part four, because I think the first three are just garbage. But from part four on, I've been totally on board with Fast and Furious. But now the notion of taking it, turning the wheel a little bit, uh, no pun intended, and coming back <laughs> to like a racing, like a street racing thing with high stakes or whatever, sure. But I think that would, uh, I think that'd be really interesting. It's going to be hard to do that, man. I it mean, will, these movies just yeah. get, it, it's, it's the same problem that the Mission Impossible movies are going to have, where it's like, Okay, well, we did this, the last one, so we have to up the stakes constantly. But if there's any time that you could do it for Fast and Furious, it's now. Because Paul Walker, you know, true, unfortunately, tragically, is mm -hmm. not in the movies anymore. You could really create, even though it's the same name, you could create like a total new franchise going forward into some direction. I like yours, you know, like with Creed going back to the beginning. Yeah. There's always something sexy about an origin story. So if there's something where there's some sort of origin story wrapped into Fast and Furious 8 and he can bring it to life, I would totally be on board with something like that because... Cars in space, cars on Mars. I mean, you really have to go to the next level. I mean, are they jumping cars <laughs> from plane to plane this time? I mean, what's going on? Oh, my happen? God, you just gave him the idea. <laughs> ah, I guarantee Fast Sorry, and Furious guys. 8 is going to have a car jumping from one plane. To and another. as they're jumping, there better be a VIN number joke right <laughs> in that car. Shaking hands with a Martian. Know your family. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. <laughs> Now, what if this, though? Let me throw this out there, okay? In this post that Vin Diesel's put up, um, and by the way, I have met Vin Diesel. I've talked to Vin Diesel. He seems like the easiest, most fun-loving, easygoing guy. Maybe he's a monster behind the scenes. I, I don't know, but he seems like really great to me. But, but in this post that he put up with this picture that we see behind me here, it doesn't actually say, he doesn't write any commentary on it. It's just the picture. He doesn't say, we have selected F. Gary Gray. What if, let me just throw this out there. What if Universal still hasn't decided who they want as director? But Vin has really gotten behind F. Gary Gray, and he's just like, I'm just gonna put this picture of me and Gary Gray up, yeah. and let let the uh, let the shitstorm ensue. Like <laughs> some some studio head in Universal went to bed, and then they woke up, and they're like, What's he doing? <laughs> 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 How did somebody go, Vin. <laughs> All right, 
what's next? <laughs> Warner Brothers has begun to engage in some fourth wall breaking marketing for their upcoming film, Batman v Superman. Real Life Trade Fortune Magazine recently published an interview with the very fictitious head of LexCorp, Alexander Luther Jr., a.k.a. Lex Luthor. In the interview, the magazine asked about his current rivalry with other companies like Wayne Enterprises and Cord Industries, and also about their involvement in military technologies. Luther said the following, It's a necessity. We live in the most dangerous point of time in all of human history. Statistically speaking, it's a near certainty that another world-changing crisis is hurtling towards us like a speeding bullet. Zing. We have to be ready to defend ourselves. <laughs> no civilization was ever conquered by having a strong military. But it's not a competition. Besides, I can't hold a candle to those guys in the debauched billionaire playboy department. <laughs> Josh, did you get anything out of this interview with Lex Luthor? Well, Mark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, zing first on the speeding bullet. Uh, second, uh, the whole no... Countries have been conquered with a strong military. That's called history. Everybody <laughs> had a strong military that was just conquered by a stronger military. That's besides the point. Uh, I read the whole interview. It was very short. Um, kind of had a few little, you know, like pokes at. As we're walking into uh, Luther, the the young wonderkind, by his crystal collections of meteors. I'm like, all right, meteor uh, crystal collection. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they don't mention anything about the haircut, um, uh, but they. It's, I mean, it's, it's cool, I guess, but it, it doesn't, doesn't give away anything from the movie. And it, I thought it was a little cheesy. I gotta say, okay, first of all, obviously the speeding bullet reference we get there, the name drop of Cord Industries, uh, of course. Um, I, I'll say this about the Cord Industry thing. So he mentions Cord Industries, and we were talking about this in our pre production meeting, but a lot of people online are saying, well, there you go, Blue Beetle's gonna be in it, Blue Beetle's gonna be around, because they said Cord Industries. I just want to remind everybody, though, that in like the um, television universe, whether when Arrow and Flash, there have been, I count, four or five references to Ferris Aviation. Uh, which is, of course, in the Green Lantern world, right? There was a boxing match where big sponsored by Ferris Aviation, or the Flash goes to some city and there's a big signpost with the city saying, home of Ferris Aviation or something Ferris. Anyway, uh, I, and I might be getting the name wrong, but you know what I'm talking about. Green Lantern's girlfriend owns an aviation company. <laughs> so, and a lot of people back then said, oh, that means Green Lantern's going to show up. No, it could just be an Easter egg. Sometimes an Easter egg really is just an Easter egg. Uh, and maybe this court industry thing means something. Maybe it's just an Easter egg. So let's not just get ahead of ourselves just yet about that. But who knows? Could mean something. This is the thing. To me, I'm with you exactly. With all the excerpts I read from the interview, mm. what struck me was, first, when you heard that Forbes is doing an interview with Lex Luthor. Cool idea. Yeah. Breaking the fourth wall, bringing the fictitious into the real, all that kind of stuff. That could be really cool. But you're right, it's fluff. Yeah, it's fluff. It felt to me like a missed opportunity to do something really, really cool. Right. Instead, it honestly, it feels like it was written by a 12-year-old, and it didn't add anything. And I really hope, look, let's remember too, Man of Steel, or Man of Steel, Batman v Superman is still six months away. I hope they don't start fatiguing uh. us with too many marketing gimmicks and too much marketing crap. All because sports center the whole time. It's just like, it's, this is the super play of the day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could be fatigued by the yeah. time it comes around. And not that I, I don't, I've, I've seen no other signs of that at all. I just, this felt like it could have been cool. Instead, it felt like fluff to me. I didn't really get anything out of it. And you know there's like a seasoned Wall Street Journal writer or Forbes writer, <laughs> Fortune magazine writer. He's been all over the world, and his boss comes like, we're going to write a piece on Lex Luthor. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do it? He's like, are you kidding me? Fine. You know? Mark, what do you think well, about I'm it? Well, I'm sorry you one percenters didn't enjoy your Fortune <laughs> magazine. This, I thought this was cool. This is like, I like when they do marketing strategies like this. It's interesting. Is the movie way too far away to maybe be doing something like this? Because you're going to be reading Fortune magazine on your lunch break at some fancy place like Panera, and you're going to be flipping it, and then you're going to forget Turkey about Bravo. it by like, have you but, ever seen somebody in Panera reading a Fortune magazine? No, Personally, I have not. I read Fortune, I read Forbes, and Condé Nast. <laughs> Your receipt about where to is long enough at Panera to be a Fortune magazine. <laughs> I just, I, I think that this might be a little too early to do something like this because it plants a seed and then you forget about it by the time Star Wars comes out and then you still got like three more months before Batman v Superman comes out. Yeah. Having said that, I think this is fun. Uh, I like the Blue Beetle reference. I think there is something to that. I don't think Blue Beetle's showing up in Batman v Superman, but it's nice to know that they are including that in 
in this universe cinematically. And the line about the debauched Playboy department, you look at Jesse Eisenberg's face, everything we've seen from him as Lex Luthor, there's a little bit of jealousy when you're talking about Bruce Wayne and when you're probably talking about this really sexy alien with a perfect chin. I think some of that (laughs) is going to play into his mindset when he's taking on Batman and Superman. Perfect chin. Have you seen his abs? (laughs) Uh, But he's, I mean, look, he's basically Facebook. He's he's the the kid that couldn't get in the, the dinner clubs at Harvard. He's the kid that had to start a, a, a revolution of a social network in order to get friends. That's Lex Luthor. He's I mean it was great casting, but that's basically what you're getting from this article. It's like I'm a 31 guy, f Bruce Wayne and his stuff because he's a billionaire playboy. Like that's what I. <laughs> that got was the, the original article. accent for the trailer, by the way. <laughs> Not many people realize yeah, that. That, that was that, the, one, that was yeah, the, so. one other thing I, I had some people complaining to me about over Twitter was saying because in that article he references his father. Yeah. who apparently was also named Alexander uh, because he says LexCorp, my dad mm-hmm. named it after himself. So he was, and, and Lex Luthor's name is actually Alexander Luthor Jr. So his dad, so I had a lot of, I'm not gonna say a lot. I had at least a dozen though, Facebook messages and tweets and, you know, saying they obviously didn't watch Smallville because yeah. his dad's name isn't Alexander. It's like, this, I, I, who still hasn't wrapped their head around that Smallville is not Superman? Yeah. That this yeah. isn't the who real Who sees thing? the Batman v Superman tour is like, I didn't see Dean Cain anywhere in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Terry Hatcher. <laughs> <laughs> We've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of him, Mark's got a few other items in the world of movie news. He's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Mark, what do we got? The first trailer for the upcoming thriller, Triple Nine, has just hit the web. The story follows a gang of criminals and corrupt cops who plan the murder of a police officer in order to pull off their biggest heist yet across town. The film stars Casey Affleck, Shilatel Ejiofor, Aaron Paul, Woody Harrelson, and Kate Winslet. Triple Nine hits theaters on February 19th. John, do you buy or sell this first trailer for Triple Nine? I buy it. What a pleasant surprise. I didn't know this trailer was dropping anytime soon. What a pleasant surprise. The tone of it, the first, and then the cast you've got in it looks incredible. It had a great intensity to it. It doesn't give almost anything away. And I, I only steal his thunder a little bit right here just in case he doesn't say it himself. But we're in our pre-production meeting, Josh goes, <laughs> any trailer that starts with Woody Harrelson drinking, you know it's about to go down. Yeah. You know it's about to get real. <laughs> I thought it was good. So yeah, for me, it's a big buy. Josh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm buying this. I'll buy it for you. I'll buy it for you. I'll buy it for anybody out there. That, I mean, I put it on the tab. This movie looks awesome. Uh, I was telling you guys, I I had to Google what triple nine means and it has a couple things about an urban dictionary. Triple nine means that you're snitching or it's, uh, what did you, what, did uh, the, it's a police code for officer down, officer down. So something in that realm, it looks like it's, you know, gangsters, this thing, this trailer had the perfect amount of machine guns and possible nudity that really got me <laughs> on board with it. Uh, you know, and amazing cast and Kate Winslet might be the underrated person but some of her scenes in this trailer let alone and this is one of those movies where if they release another trailer I'm not going to watch it if it's this one I'm good with that because I want to go into the movie fresh unlike Southpaw or something like that right where this Kate Winslet can do no wrong the whole cast Casey Affleck Woody Harrelson with bad teeth and a drinking problem? Come on, that's just genius. <laughs> I, I totally buy this. And as somebody who's familiar with police codes, both from being in the back of a cop car and my Twitter handle's 5150Ls. Come yeah. on, <laughs> I know how to speak this stuff. I love this trailer. It was like Point Break and Sicario got yeah. drunk in Vegas and had a kid. That's mm. is what I want to see. More Sicario-like action and that intensity. The yeah. feeling I got, it was like watching a tiny movie. Yeah. I was like, I was gripping my computer, watching it. And also Norman Reedus, who I didn't mention right there. Ooh. But the fact that Daryl from Walking Dead is in this movie. He looks so good in whatever role he's playing. Is he a corrupt cop? Is he one of the criminals? You don't know yet. And I love walking into a movie when you have no idea who the good guy is, who the bad guy is, or if anybody's going to be totally noble or totally evil. I like to call that like the departed syndrome is when you watch the trailer Mm, for Departed, you didn't know Mark Wahlberg was bad or Leonardo DiCaprio was bad. Obviously, knew Jack Nicholson was bad, but you didn't know, right? That's what this movie has. It has that, that, who, where's it going to go kind of, Departed feel. I love that. Let me ask you guys about this. The date is February 19th. Not necessarily a banner week for movies. I mean, we're going to be coming off of Valentine's Day fair and stuff like that. What else is coming right around that? Deadpool. Ah, the, is the week before. Yeah, so right. now you've, yeah, they're creating now, they're taking advantage, Deadpool is going to create an event atmosphere at movie theaters. And when you can be a studio that rides, you know, rides the draft of that a little bit and get on the coattails of that and take advantage of that, you know, the buzz is around the movie theaters right now because Deadpool's coming out. I think that's a very 
purposeful tact on their part. I think they're banking on people going to see Get Deadpool, liking it, having a great experience in the movie theater, and think we should go to the movies again next weekend. What's out? Triple nine. Boom. And, and go take you it. So can I convince like your girlfriend that one's a pre-Valentine's Day and one's a post-Valentine's <laughs> Day. I also want to point this out, too. I was really fascinated to see that Teresa Palmer's in this. Now, Teresa Palmer is a young actress who... I honestly expected by this point to be a lot bigger than she is. I first recognized or noticed her in uh, Take Me Home Tonight, mm -hmm. that uh, 80s movie that had every song from the 80s except, except Take Me Home it Tonight. It was a bummer not having the money man in the I've never right? understood that whatsoever. But then she was uh, in this really bad movie called I Am Number Four or I Am Number Six. I can't remember the name of it. But she was actually quite good at it. And then she was in that zombie romantic movie, Warm Bodies, oh, which, which I was thought she was underrated. Yeah, that's a great very movie. underrated. Yeah. I thought it was a really solid movie. Yeah. And so I'm excited to see her pop up in a film like this. This. That's not just your teen, you know, schlub kind of movie. This is actually another level for her, so I'm hoping it takes her somewhere. All right, what's next? According to a story in The Hollywood Reporter, Sony Pictures is moving forward with a remake of the 1990 film Flatliners. The report also claims that actress Ellen Page will star in the new film, which will be directed by the original Girl with the Dragon Tattoo helmer, Nels Arden Oplev. The original film, which starred Kiefer Sutherland and Julia Roberts, is described as follows. I nailed that pronunciation, boy. <laughs> Seeking answers about the afterlife, Chicago medical student Nelson persuades his fellow pupils to help him end his life and then resuscitate him in the nick of time. As the experiments become more perilous, each is forced to contend with the paranormal consequences of trespassing on the other side. Josh, do you buy or sell the idea of a Flatliners remake with Ellen Page? Oh, no. I'm selling this. I'd short it in the international market, too. I, I don't... <laughs> Listen, this is good. We talked about it the last week when I was on the show. If you do a reboot or a remake of a movie that really wasn't like some sort of classic, like Flatliners, the first one was good. I mean, it was one of those movies. If it's on, I'll probably watch it or catch some of it. But if you did a movie similar to Flatliners and you called it something else, it might be better. It might have an, an end to the studio or an end to the audience that isn't the whole people going in like, that's not as good as the first one, right? That's what this has. That's You don't need it. Why, why call it Flatliners? I, I don't mind Ellen Page, but I, I'm selling this. Yeah. I am surprisingly going to buy this. The Okay, first of all, it's been at least 15 years since I've seen the original, yeah. but I remember liking the original quite a bit. I'm a big Kiefer Sutherland fan, too. So the, actually, all across the board, Oliver Platt, I'm a huge fan of Oliver Platt. There's a lot of really good people in that original. That being said, Josh, myself, Mark, we are part of a very rare breed of people who did actually see it. It's 25 years yeah. old, this movie. I think it's safe to say there is a large percentage of the current movie going on. Is that probably, number one, has never seen the original Flatliners, and there's probably a good number of them never even heard of the original right. Flatliners. When you think about the subject matter, too, paranormal stuff right now in movies is really hot. The, you pitch the idea, a bunch of medical students want to experiment with what's beyond death, and they experiment with killing each other and then bringing themselves back to life to see what's going on. If you just pitch that as an idea, I think that is an idea that works, never mind the fact that it's a remake of a 25-year-old movie. I think this is one of those films that you can reboot and reboot well. So for me, myself, I'm going to go with a buy. I'm going to buy it as well. And I'm surprised to hear myself say that because I love the original Flatliners. I saw it when I was a really young kid. I'm like, this is such an intriguing premise, even more so than the star power that was in that movie. I love the idea of like just 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 vacationing in the afterlife for a couple minutes <laughs> and then coming back. And how has technology progressed thus far with the ways you can you, you can use modern science in here? I don't know that there's been a lot of, you know, breakthroughs in going to the afterlife and then resuscitating somebody else. Like, nobody's going to get back there and then, like, you know, check Vin Diesel's Facebook post <laughs> when you're in the afterlife. Such a universal edit. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you do want to know who's directing Fast and sure. Furious 8, even if you're dead. So Ellen Page, to me, I just saw her in uh, the uh, movie with uh, Julian Moore. Um, uh, oh, oh, I know the uh, one you're talking Freehill. about. Uh, and she's terrific in that. And, and she's a really good actress. And... I th you need to surround her with a cast that's also dynamite to complement her. Having said that, I think that they're going to do a good job with Flatliners, and I'm excited about the reboot. I think what all the audience wants to know is, Mark, your, your dad, a doctor, did you go up to your dad after yeah. Flatliners? But can we do this? Is this possible? <laughs> My dad wanted to try it on me a number <laughs> yeah. of times. Your dad's a doctor? Uh, he was a doctor, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Doc uh, the one thing, though, I will say this in contradiction to what my previous point was, saying, hey, you know, it's supernatural stuff, great. A bunch of students of premise, let's see what lies beyond death, blah, blah, blah. Olivia Wilde just did a movie called The Lazarus Effect, which is also kind of similar yeah. to that in premise. So, 
I'll, I'll, I understand that. I'll keep that in mind. That did not work out so well. And granted, Ellen Page is not what Julia Roberts was in her heyday. Fine. But I, I still think there is big upside to this. The fear for this, though, is that you brought up that how popular horror is and that if they just take that angle where we're just trying to make a quick buck, we just want to have a good opening weekend and make this movie for $5 million. And if we make $10 million opening weekend, we're going to be happy. I hope they treat this the story, the source material with respect because there's a lot of cool things you but can you discuss. But you don't get Niels Oplev if you're just going for a quick buck. You get any run-of-the-mill kind of director in Hollywood right now to do that. I think going to get the original director of the original Girl of the Dragon Tattoo says, at least that suggests to me they want to make something kind of special right. if they can. And the inherent spin-off Grey's Anatomy web series is going to be incredible. <laughs> just incredible. <laughs> All right, what's next? Uh, now it's that time for Mailbag, John. Are you oh, ready? Oh, I'm ready for Mailbag. Uh, no, we're going to buy and sell one more. As most of you know, the Harry Potter <laughs> I knew universe I wasn't wrong. <laughs> film, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, is already well into production. And according to a report in The Hollywood Reporter, they've just added another cast member, actor John Voigt a four-time Oscar nominee and one-time winner. He also owned a car in Seinfeld, has joined the film. <laughs> it was a LeBaron, Mark. The David Yates-directed film follows Newt Scamander, played by Eddie Redmayne, the Wizarding World's preeminent magizoologist, who in his travels has encountered and documented a myriad of magical creatures, ultimately leading to his penning the Hogwarts school textbook, Fantastic Beasts, and Where to Find Them. John, do you buy or sell John Voight joining Fantastic Beasts and where to find well, it? Well, look, I'm not going to pretend to be super excited about it because we don't... I mean, it's hard to get too excited when I don't know what role he's playing or anything about it. But like you mentioned, and we say this all the time, it's never a mistake to add talent. John Voight is a four-time Academy Award nominee. To me, though, his greatest performance, and the one I'll always think of him as, is Derek Zoolander's dad. Uh, in <laughs> Zoolander, that's what he will always be to me. Um, yes. so, so just on that basis alone, without getting too excited about it, I'll say for me it's a buy. What about you, Mark? Yeah, sure. It's it's what we talked about on the show. I think it might have even been yesterday when you talk about adding Gleason and Irons to oh my God, something yeah. uh, to a project. And when you're adding John Boyd to anything, yeah, it's a credit to it. He's great on Ray Donovan, and obviously he's got an amazing film career too. So he adds credibility. He adds a seniority, a presence to a movie that's going to help ground it in reality. You're in this fantastical world with magical beasts, and they're roaming all over the place. John Boyd lends that. It's going to be like maybe like what a Gary Oldman was for the Harry. Harry Potter franchise, where you bring in a veteran actor who can lend something else to it. Yeah, Josh? I think I think it's an easy buy. Uh, like Mark said, John Voight's turn as Mickey Donovan and Ray Donovan, it's it's been awesome. The fact that he's he's nominated all the time. It, that show, Leif Schreiber runs the show, but Mickey Donovan is the reason you keep turning tuning in every mm -hmm. week to that show because he is. Awesome. You know, He's I've never awesome. seen an episode. Oh, dude, you'd love that. I show. keep hearing everybody it's tells me it's an, really great. Fantastic show, and uh, and and. John Voight as Mickey Donovan has taken this whole older guy, you know, thing into a modern day kind of gangster of just badass. He, he's he's really, really great in Ray Donovan. Now, in the Harry Potter world, how that trans translates, I don't know. Are they going to make him do a British accent or is he going to be like an American hmm. minor reprising his role from Derek Zoop from Zoolander? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but again, like you said, adding talent can never hurt. And and John Voight just has a gravitas about him. And when you're talking about yeah. something in the when the adults in Harry Potter all have gravitas because they're magicians that do all this stuff and the kids that look up to him, throw John Voight in there. Bring him in in a LeBaron. See if he can... <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't the bite anybody. No, the periodontist. Okay. <laughs> All right, folks. Now we have reached that part of the show for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can just email us anytime to collidervideo at gmail.com. Send on in your questions, and we'll see if we can get one of yours on one of our shows. So for now, Mark, what is in our mailbag today? Aaron writes, hey, Collider crew, I was wondering what some of your favorite guilty pleasure films are. Personally, I love Demolition Man for being so bad that it's good. Uh, I've got a couple that I always, none of these you have not heard me say before. I'll start with Armageddon. Armageddon is a guilty pleasure yes. movie of mine, the Michael Bay film. A lot of people crap on that movie, so I kind of hang my head and go, I like <laughs> Armageddon. I really do. I like Armageddon. Uh, the other one, which I cannot recommend enough, so many of you out there have still not seen this movie, and you must. Ice, Cool as Ice by with Vanilla Ice. So Cool as Ice with Vanilla Ice, it is absolutely the funniest 
unintentionally funny movie I have ever seen. Are we the only two people that have watched that? I love that movie. I freaking love yeah. that movie. You yes. get a group of friends together, 15 or 20 of you, have some alcohol, have some food, and watch Cool as Ice. Oh, my God. The other one, I shouldn't even call a guilty pleasure because it's just awesome, and that's Mystery Men. Um, but so many people haven't ah, seen it, I almost good. feel like I have to yeah. qualify it as a guilty pleasure. So those are ones that I usually fall in that category. What about you, Mark? Well, see, it's hard for me to admit that the movies I love are guilty pleasures because I think they should be universally lauded for the Oscar contending films they were, Jeez. but a lot of Van Damme's movies. <laughs> just say, hey, Mark, why'd your mom name you Chance? Oh, well, my mama took one. <laughs> I love Hard Target to death. Oh, and I love Hard Target. Every year it seems to age a little more and what more. What was the villain in Hard Target? Wasn't that guy's name Pick, wasn't it? Uh, Pick, yeah. Well, yeah. Pick was played by Arnold Boslow, and then you had Lance Henriksen Anderson as and the, boss, the yeah. lead role. And... You had Wilfred Wilford Brimley, Brimley. No, that's scoring right. a Cajun accent, which I'm convinced the production had no intention of him having a Cajun accent. He just showed up and decided to speak Cajun yep. for an afternoon. Um, I'll give it to that. And then also sometimes spoof movies get labeled as guilty pleasures, even though we don't necessarily, even if they're great movies, like Josh and I on his show Guilty Movie Pleasures talked about Top Secret. And Top Secret oh, is one of my... Oh, nothing guilty about oh, that. It is nothing just fall down that. hilarious. Not a the guilty dream. pleasure, but I'm glad I got to talk about it. Yes. You know what? Speaking of oh, Wilford Brimley, let me just throw it in there. He's got dumb. Uh, also, also, I, I feel bad calling Guilty Pleasure because I think it's awesome, but so many of you have not seen it. Uh, Remo Williams, The Adventure Begins with uh, oh, him. Oh, going deep. Oh, oh yeah. my. I've never seen that. We'll oh, it's it. so good. Okay. It is so good. Okay. Check that one out when you get a chance. What about you, Josh? Well, you know, I every week I talk about a guilty movie pleasure. Everybody, uh, you know, it, it's such a divisive thing that oh, sure. everybody by, loves By definition. It. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but my two... It, Airborne, it's a 1992 <laughs> rollerblading movie that oh is unbelievable. It takes place in Cincinnati. <laughs> Seth Green. Um, it's it, Nobody's ever seen it. it. Nobody, but it is is awesome. And if it's ever on late night television, check it out. Jack Black is in it. Young Jack Black. Really? Yeah. yeah. I hear it's the flatliners of the rollerblading community. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, Airborne is just absolutely one of the best. And um, everybody hates on it. I loved Predator 2. I loved Predator 2. Ah. I got to go back and see Predator 2 because I've really been enjoying Reuben Blades on Fear the Walking Dead and yeah. he pops into Predator 2 and then you also have Danny Glover and the yeah. one, the only, the irreplaceable Gary freaking Busey's in that. Yes. Oh, that's yeah. right. I don't hate I don't hate that movie. I just don't never think about it. Yeah. That's and it's cool at the end to see like the Xenomorph like trophy in uh -huh. the Predator ship. That's yes. like what everybody points to is like, oh, well, that part, that's kind of like, it, it's one of those things, even if the movie isn't great, it's still worth watching just to see that scene. Yeah. yeah. All right. What's next? Yeah. Seth Bernard writes, Hey, Collider, I love the show and listen daily. My question is about Oscar campaigns. I understand why studios and movies campaign during Oscar season, but in a perfect world, shouldn't the best movie win instead of the movie that the voters see the most of around town? Um, well, yes, but in a perfect world, there you just elect the best person for president and you don't have to have a campaign for it either. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, you, you're right. You understood that why they're doing it. You, but it's still a voting process. It's still a subjective thing with six to 7,000 voting members that you want to make sure you keep your movie front and foremost in their attention. You want to bring it and constantly put it in their face to have them thinking about it. At the end of the day, those voters should still be voting for what they thought was the best movie. It's like, but you have a responsibility too as a studio because Oscar buzz makes you money. Um, it, especially if your film comes out around Oscar season, which is why a lot of these studios, if they feel they have a movie that could contend for an Oscar, they'll schedule it closer to Oscar season to make sure they can financially take advantage of that buzz. But also, you know, the studios have responsibility to the people in their movies. Like, if you have a director and you did a great job, you have responsibility to that director to campaign for him and say, hey, make sure you think about this film that these guys did. So in a perfect world, yes, no campaigning needed. But we don't live in a perfect world, so it kind of is needed. I know, Josh, how do you see well, it? Well... I think that maybe what the question is getting at is that the Academy voters are somehow swayed by billboards on Sunset Boulevard. Ah, uh, right. Which is, I don't think is the case. I think what the case is, is that you're campaigning during Oscar season to see a lot of these brilliant performances may not be the most well-respected movie per se, or one that was even in many theaters. But if, if you come out and campaign for an Oscar, perfect example last year, Jennifer Aniston and Cake, okay? She was great in that movie. She really was. She really that was. movie had some problems and the movie was okay. But because of all the buzz and the campaigning that was around Cake, I went to see it in the theaters. And maybe that supported that. A lot of those smaller movies that don't get that push initially because people aren't really sure, but then it starts getting Oscar buzz. That's what I think the campaigning really helps. Do I think it actually helps and skew the voting? No. 
No. no. The billboards, and I think this is the point you're making, the billboards on Hollywood Boulevard or on Sunset, whatever, they do not influence or change an Oscar Academy's voting. Yeah. But it gets idiots like me or Josh or Mark to go, yeah, you, you know what? Maybe I should revisit that movie. Right. It's as much for getting more people to see the movie as it is for getting the Oscar yeah. voters to see it. I, I think, sadly, sometimes it does, though. I think sometimes just the last thing in your head before you go into a voting booth or anything like that, it can stick there a little bit. Now, in a perfect world, if you saw a billboard for, for let's say, one of my favorite movies, Double Impact, for your consideration, vote Double Impact <laughs> yeah. for Best Picture of the Year. You see that, <laughs> and you shouldn't be thinking, I'm going to vote for Double Impact. You should see that and say, I need to take some time today and look at the movies that I love this year. So yeah. instead of letting the specific movie remind you of voting for that. Just say, I need to look at all the movies that came out because we see a ton of movies every year and sometimes you need a gentle reminder. Now, what political campaigns have is regulations. Is that you're allowed to spend this money on this, you're not allowed to spend this money on this. Do those regulations get broken all the time? Of course they do. Yeah. It's politics. And I'm <laughs> sure that there might be down the road some sort of regulation when it comes to campaigning for Oscars because like anything else, it started out as just, hey, we just want to give you a gentle reminder. We made this small movie. Please or make sure you see it. And then then it starts to snowball, and then that's when you get the billboards all around town, and we get inundated and oversaturated with all different kind of marketing campaigns to the point when it's chaos, and it might escalate to that at some point, and when that happens, you will need to regulate it. And on the flip side of that, which is, it's a tragedy, was was Bad Boys 2 in 2003. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that wasn't... Dan uh, Marino for Best Supporting Actor. <laughs> <laughs> all right, last question of the day. Jesse T. writes, My question is about movies you've changed your mind about. Mm. I thought the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford was boring and pointless the first time I watched it, but now I really love it. I was wondering, what movie has your opinion changed about the most since you first watched it? I love the example you bring up of the assassination of Jesse James. I think a lot of people, if, if you paid attention to the marketing, you shouldn't have been confused. But I think a lot of people, when they, Western, shoot him up. Yeah, that's <laughs> the And it's not, but it is a brilliant movie. Actually, I got a really good friend of mine, uh, the uh, the awards guy, coverage coverage guy for Variety magazines, Chris Tapley, friend of the show, whatever. Uh, I know that is like one of his all-time favorite films. You go into his place, and he's got this giant, uh, the assassination of Jesse James by the uh, coward Robert Ford poster hanging on, so that he got this really great framing job done on. Brilliant film. Here's a two for me. I'm going to go one each way. Movie I hated at first, realized that I loved it. Movie that I thought I loved at first, realized I hated it. You've heard me say both of these. The movie that I loved and my first experience, and then realized I was fooling myself, was The Phantom Menace. Um, and actually, all the all of the prequel films. At first, I, I lied to myself. Oh, I like this. Um, so I walked in and I walked out of the first time because I was so desperate for Star Wars. I'm like, yeah, that was awesome. And all I would talk about is the lightsaber duel at the end and uh, the pod race. And you know, as much everybody knows how much I hate the prequels, just hate them. <laughs> I will defend to the death three things in the prequels: that lightsaber fight between Obi Wan and uh, and Darth Maul. A lot of people say. I know Christian sometimes feels it's like too orchestrated. It's too smooth to me. It shows the elegance of the Jedi and stuff like that. I really love that fight, and I love the pod racing scene. One of the best full marks to Ben Burt, one of the best uses of sound design in any scene in Hollywood history, I think, is that pod race scene. And then and f lightsaber fighting Yoda. I know a lot of people hated that, and I hate the movies, <laughs> but I will defend lightsaber fighting Yoda. I thought that was badass. But... It was, for me, it was one of those things where I just realized after seeing it like the 16th, 17th, and 18th time, because I was also working in visual effects at the time, so I was going to see it like every day, <laughs> I realized this movie really is a sack of crap. I mean, this is awful. Anyway, so there's that one. Going the other way, Inglorious Bastards. I, I don't know what was wrong with me the day that I saw it, but I came out of watching that movie thinking, that movie sucked. What's everybody talking about? Like, I was completely befuddled. I couldn't understand why anybody liked this movie. And then I had this girl over that I really wanted to score with, and she wanted to watch it. So I was like, okay, okay, sure, yeah, let's put it in Glorious Bastards, whatever. And I watched it again. I'm like, what was I thinking? This movie's awesome. And the movie was is really great. Nothing so, says sexy time like beating a Jewish man with a baseball bat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, it's it's just, that's the way. So the, yeah, the movie I thought I liked at first, realized I hated it, was Phantom Menace. Movie I thought I hated first and then ended up really loving it for me is Inglorious Bastards. What about you, Josh? Uh, I'm gonna I'm kind of kind of stick with it in a Quentin Tarantino form, uh, and I know I get a lot of hate, but Reservoir Dogs. The first time I saw it, I didn't love it. I thought it was really slow, and I was just kind of like, but maybe I was kind of young, so I didn't get it. But then as I watch it as an adult over and over again, it's absolutely fantastic. And I think in the same realm, and I know I'll get a ton of hate for this one, but first time I saw Big Lebowski, I was like, I don't get it. 
I don't get this. And then the, the next eight times I watched it, I was like, okay, <laughs> I get it. Because everybody that I was friends with was like, dude, Big Lebowski's the greatest movie ever. And so I just kept watching it like, okay, okay, yeah. Oh, oh. And you you notice the nuances in directors like that kind of And that of movie's movies. all nuanced. Oh, I mean, yeah. It really it's is. It's all dialogue. It's both of those movies, obviously Tarantino, but all those movies, it's just catching the, the correct dialogue and seeing where the story goes, how simplistic it is, and yet complex. That's hilarious, because I was kind of the same way with Lebowski, too, because all yeah. my college buddies loved it. And I was I watching it. I was like, yeah, this is this is fine, whatever. Then every time you watch it, you just slowly pick up more and yeah, it just gets yeah. better and better. A movie that I did love and then I ended up hating um, is it, it's a harder double one impact. for me because double impact I will love until the day <laughs> I cop. die. I mean, look, look the easy, it, it's a lot easier to go for like if you look at in my movie reviewing career, I saw Mirror Mirror and was pretty happy with it. Like, I didn't love it, but I was like, that's a damn good fantasy movie. I haven't revisited it since. Same thing uh -huh. with Sucker Punch is that I loved it when I saw it because I love Led Zeppelin and I love hot chicks beating the crap out of people. And I haven't revisited it since then. And everybody tells me I need to see it again because it's just not that good of a movie. That was one of the reasons that and the Al movie were why I was so excited that Zack Snyder was going to be doing Man of Steel. Yeah. So I need to revisit Sucker Punch, and I admit that. Now, the movie that I didn't like at all when I first saw it that I now love, South Park. Bigger, oh, longer, oh, and uncut. Wow. Me and my yeah. brother went to go see that, and we missed the initial train. And if you miss a comedy opening weekend or the first couple weekends, it's a different experience you get in a theater. It was just me and my brother <laughs> and one other weirdo sitting way up front. <laughs> And it was just, we, it was, I, I thought it was too musical. I thought that it, well, there was a song every five minutes. I'm like, I don't want another damn song. But now when I put it on, I appreciate those songs for the incredible pieces of comedy that they are. And that movie as a whole yeah. is just fall down funny. And you know, Campia hates that because blame Canada. Oh my, <laughs> they, they do so much great. They, three great things to South Park is known with Canadians. Number one is the movie, the yeah. blame Canada. That thing is great. The other one was that episode they did. Remember six, seven years ago when the writer strike was going on? On. And the guys at South Park made an analogy of the writers and the writer strike to Canada going on strike because Canada wanted more internet money, <laughs> which was exactly the issue at the Writers Guild. And th th hence came the song Canada on Strike, right. um, which was great. And then the third thing they did, which was just last season, I think. They did an episode about freemium mobile gaming. Mm -hmm. Those games that are free to download, but if you actually really want to get anywhere, you have to start spending money. I spent over $200 on Simpsons Tapped Out, a free <laughs> game. So they did a whole episode on what like bullcrap like freemium gaming is, and it turns out that it was being perpetrated by like the Canadian devil. Um, it was so the funny. Canadian devil. And then the, then the, the real Satan had to come and have an argument with him. It was... Just gold stuff. I love the way they do the Canadian yeah. well, Look, they've already apologized for Brian Adams on multiple occasions. <laughs> I actually did, like Brian Adams. Did you ever see that there was a piece of fan art? This is going back about a year and a half ago when we were still with AMC. But some fan did that fan art of all the Movie Talk crew as... Canadians from South Park. Yes. Do you remember that picture? Yes. It was brilliant. Yeah, it somebody so tweet funny. that to us. I because I'm just too lazy to go research it. But yeah, it was hysterical. I just love the fact that they make Canadians like look different, like their their mouths move different than well, Americans. Well, they're at the top of the so bottoms of their heads are disconnected and stuff like that. Oh, so, <laughs> so good. true. <laughs> All right, folks. So true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that will do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films are playing at our friends over at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. I want to thank the guys sitting on the panel with me. First of all, sitting over here to my left, Mr. Josh McCuga. Josh, where can people find you online? Uh, at Josh McCuga on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, tomorrow is the first Arrow recap show after the season premiere of Arrow on CW. So. We'll be here on Collider talking all about that, and you guys can see my uh, YouTube channel, Between the Sheets TV. And, of course, sitting over here, the lovely... I Sorry, that... That's just normally what I say. <laughs> Mr. Mark Ellis, Mark, where can people find you online? You can actually find a few of my episodes up between the sheets. And Josh has been one of my best friends for a long time. I'm so happy to see you be as funny and as hairy as you are off camera, <laughs> on camera on this show. You can tweet me or Instagram me at 5150 Ellis and get my stand-up album, Get to the Castle, on iTunes. And, of course, uh, you can find me on Facebook and on Twitter at John Campion and watch for my first novel, The Pride, coming out in December. I will keep you guys up to date with the release of that. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks to Wendy and Dennis behind the camera. And most of all, thanks to you. Remember, the most important part of this show is not what this group of idiots up here has to say. <laughs> it's what you have to say. Make sure you jump into the comments section below and leave your thoughts on any or all the topics that we discuss here today. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye.